Well, hello everyone, and welcome once again to Vlogatas. I'm Phil Ramsey, and in this Bible 2 series, we go through the Word together, chapter and verse. And uh, we are in the last episode of the book of Ezekiel. So, congratulations, you made it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, very, you know, fascinating run of passages, but uh, difficult to understand, difficult to get through. But that's all right, you know. Um, and uh, so we're going to go ahead and finish it up now. I don't have anything highlighted out in these uh, these last chapters here. So let's go ahead and pray, and we'll jump in. Father, I thank you for this book. I thank you that uh, it has very uh, useful things for us to learn, useful things for us to meditate upon and to, to pray about and consider, uh, you know, in ways that we can uh, examine our own conduct before you. And I thank you for these things. I ask that you would give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you, the eyes of our understanding being enlightened, that we may know and understand what it is your what your will is for us, Lord God. And uh, we thank you for these things. And in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Okay, so Ezekiel chapter 47. In my vision, the man brought me back to the entrance of the temple. There I saw a stream flowing east from beneath the door of the temple and passing to the right of the altar on its south side. The man brought me outside the wall through the north gateway and led me around to the eastern entrance. There I could see the water flowing out the south side of the east gateway. Measuring as he went, he took me along the stream for 1,750 feet, then led me across. The water was up to my ankles. He measured off another 1,750 feet and led me across again. This time the water was up to my knees. After another 1,750 feet, it was up to my waist. Then he measured another 1,750 feet, and the river was too deep to walk across. It was deep enough to swim in, but too deep to walk through. He asked me, Have you been watching, son of man? Then he led me back along the river bank. So what's interesting is you have this uh, crossing back and forth of the river, you know, after certain uh, lengths of measure. And uh, in other words, it's like, have you been watching? Have you been paying attention? You know, that, that's, that's the question that uh, Ezekiel is asked after, after the end of that. In other words, uh, are you paying attention to the significance of this? You know, the first time it's ankle deep and then, you know, uh, then it's knee deep and then it's waist deep. And then uh, he's got to swim across this. And I've been in many services where people use this passage and they, they talk about that in the sense of getting deeper in God's presence you know, in that time and place. And, you know, people get really excited when you, when you start to, uh, when, when that is mentioned in, in, in times of worship and prayer and things like that. And, uh, I really, I don't know that we really understand the significance of it. You know, to me, you know, this could be, um, I mean, this, this measurement along the river bank and then the crossing over could represent different uh, d times and seasons or different dispensations, you know, just the distance of the riverbank could be a measure of time. I mean, we're in a, it, this is a vision here. He is very clear. He's in a vision when this happens. And so these physical attributes uh, can represent spiritual things, but they can also re represent measure measurements of, of things that they don't uh, physically appear to be there, you know, so, so, um, you know, what, uh, what does it mean? You know, what's the significance of it? And uh, he's like, have you been watching? And Ezekiel doesn't answer. And, you know, one thing that's a, that is very interesting about Ezekiel as a person is he doesn't have a lot of responses to God. You know, I mean, to the point where we might, I mean, if we, we could make the mistake of not really thinking of Ezekiel as uh, being a real person. You know, he's not like, He's not like Peter, who a lot of times we talk about as being someone who was constantly putting his foot in his mouth and saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. You know, um, he's not like, uh, you know, was, uh, I mean, his relationship with God is different than what we see with, with, as with Jeremiah, although they had a similar call, you know. Uh, so Ezekiel is, is his own person, and he doesn't say a lot. In fact, he didn't even, even when his wife died, he didn't have anything to say. That doesn't mean that he didn't feel deeply, and it does not mean that he did not, uh, you know, ponder these things and, and wonder about them. The times that we see Ezekiel responding to God the most is when 
in the face of the execution of God's judgment and you see uh, people perishing and falling, that's when Ezekiel is like, Lord, is everyone going to die? You know, and so Ezekiel was a man who cared deeply for people. And, and so it's just interesting, you know, and even, even Ezekiel's response we saw in the, dry, the, the Valley of Dry Bones, where God asks him, son of man, can these bones live again? Ezekiel's response is, Lord, you know, you know, um, and so Ezekiel is a, he just, he's a man of few words, which is interesting because God called him to be a prophet. And so God told him specifically at the beginning of this book, he's like, you will, you, I'm going to give you my words and you're only to speak in the hearing of the people what I tell you to speak. And Ezekiel, uh, from all outward appearances, was very faithful to that call. And, uh, and so that's why, again, I'll just, you know, at the end of the latter part of this book, at the, at the end of it, where um, people bring up this, this issue of the watchmen and they're like, because God called Ezekiel as a watchman for the people to warn them of impending danger in the form of sin and disloyalty to God. And uh, because it would bring about the destruction. But see, uh, people, you know, they, 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 they Christians talk to other Christians and they say, see, you're supposed to be a watchman like Ezekiel is. We're all called to do that. To a certain degree, we are all called to uh, hold each other accountable, you know, but but God was very specific with Ezekiel. He said, you're only to speak, when, it, when acting as my watchman, you're only to speak the words that I put in your mouth. And so people in the name of being a watchman will call people out on stuff that they have personal convictions about. And I mean, they, they in other words... The Bible says that in the multitude of sin, or the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. And so it's easy to say too much and get ourselves into trouble. And Ezekiel was very guarded in what he said. And so uh, it's just a, an interesting thing. And so, you know, people take take this passage about the, the water being ankle deep, knee deep, waist deep, and they kind of put their own interpretation on it. And they say, this is what we think this means, or they imply what they think it means. And it's like, not even Ezekiel tried to, because the, the, the man asked him, have you been watching this? And he doesn't even reply. You know, I'm sure that there's an affirmative that, yes, I've been watching, but he doesn't try to put an interpretation upon it. You know, and so it's just a, it's just a, a different way of thinking, you know, especially these days when social media teaches us that we ought to be saying anything that we think about anything or any word, any thought that pops into our mind, we should, we should put it out there for, for everyone to know, you know, because our opinion is, um, glorified, you know, and so anyway, self-control. So verse seven, when I returned, I was surprised by the sight of many trees growing on both sides of the river. Then he said to me, this river flows east through the desert into the valley of the Dead Sea. The waters of this stream will make the salty waters of the Dead Sea fresh and pure. There will be swarms of living things wherever the water of this river flows. Fish will abound in the Dead Sea, for its waters will become fresh. Life will flourish wherever this water flows. Fishermen will stand strong along the shores of the Dead Sea. Stand strong. Fishermen will stand along, excuse me, <laughs> stand along the shores of the Dead Sea, all the way from Engedi to in to in Eglaim. The shores will be covered with nets drying in the sun. Fish of every kind will fill the Dead Sea, just as they fill the Mediterranean. But the marshes and swamps will not be purified. They will still be salty. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow along both sides of the river. The leaves of these trees will never turn brown and fall, and there will always be fruit on their branches. There will be a new crop every month, for they are watered by the river flowing from the temple. The fruit will be for food, and the leaves for healing. So it sounds to me like there is a great... There is a, a spiritual dimension to this river that Ezekiel is seeing. And so some people talk about how it will be a physical river and, and the Dead Sea will be a lot. Maybe, you know, but it does seem that even if that's the case, that there is a spiritual side to this vision that has a different application, you know, or perhaps a parallel application. So then uh, verse 13. But the, uh, so this is what the Lord says: Divide the land in this way for the twelve tribes of Israel. The descendants of Joseph will be given two shares of land. Otherwise, each tribe will receive an equal share because you've got the two tribes. You've got uh, Manasseh and Ephraim. Um, you know, uh, 
Joseph's sons. So verse 14, otherwise each tribe will receive an equal share. I took a solemn oath and swore that I would give this land to your ancestors, and it will now come to you as your possession. These are the boundaries of the land. The northern border will run from the Mediterranean toward Hethlon, then on through Lebohamath to Zadad. Then it will run to, uh, to Berathah and Sibraim, which are on the border between Damascus and Hamath, and finally to Hazar Hadakon, on the border of, ha of Hauron. So the northern border will run from the Mediterranean to Hazar Anon, on the border between Hamath to the north and Damascus to the south. The eastern border starts at a point between Hauron and Damascus and runs south along the Jordan River, between Israel and Gilead, past the Dead Sea, and as far south as Tamar. This will be the eastern border. The southern border will go west from Tamar to the waters of Meribah and Kadesh, and then follow the course of the brook of Egypt to the Mediterranean. This will be the southern border. On the west side, the Mediterranean itself will be your border, from the southern border to the point where the northern border begins, opposite Libo Hamath. Divide the land within these boundaries among the tribes of Israel. Distribute the land as an allotment for yourselves and for the foreigners who have joined you and are raising their families among you. They will be like native-born Israelites to you and will receive an allotment among the tribes. These foreigners are to be given land within the territory of the tribe with whom they now live. I, the Lord, have spoken. I, the Sovereign Lord, have spoken. Excuse me. Chapter 48 Here is the list of the tribes of Israel and the territory each is to receive. The territory of Dan is in the extreme north. Its boundary line follows the, the Hethlon road to Lebohamath and then runs on to Hazar Anon on the border of Damascus with Hamath to the north. Dan's territory extends all the way across the land of Israel from east to west. Asher's territory lies south of Dan's and also extends from east to west. Naphtali's land uh, lies south of Asher's, also extending from east to west. Then comes Manasseh south of Naphtali, and its territory also extends from east to west. South of Manasseh is Ephraim, and then Reuben, and then Judah, all of whose boundaries extend from east to west. South of Judah is the land set aside for a special purpose. It will be eight and one, th uh, eight and three quarter mile wide, and will extend as far east and west as the tribal territories, with the temple at its center. The area set aside for the Lord's temple will be eight and three quarter miles long, and six and two thirds miles wide. For the priests, there will be a strip of land measuring eight and three quarter miles long by three and th uh, one third miles wide, with the Lord's temple at the center. This area is set aside for the ordained priests, the descendants of Zadok, who served me faithfully and did not go astray with the people of Israel and the rest of the Levites. It will be their special portion when the land is distributed, the most sacred land of all. Next to the priest's territory will lie the land where the other Levites live. The land allotted to the Levites will be the same size and shape as that belonging to the priests, eight and three quarter miles long and three and one third miles wide. Together, these portions of land will measure eight and three quarter miles long by six and two third miles wide. None of this special land may ever be sold or traded or used by others, for it belongs to the Lord. It is set apart as holy. An additional strip of land, eight and one three quarter, eight and three quarter miles long, by one and two third miles wide, south of the sacred temple area, will be allotted for public use, homes, pasture lands, and common lands, with a city at its, at the center. The city will measure one and a half miles on each side, north, south, east, and west. Open lands will surround the city for 150 yards in every direction. Outside the city, there will be a farming area that stretches three and one-third miles to the east and three and one-third miles to the west along the border of the sacred area. This farmland will produce food for the people working in the city. Those who come from the various tribes to work in the city may farm it. This entire area, including the sacred lands in the city, is a square that measures eight and one-third miles on each side. The areas that remain to the east and to the west of the sacred lands of this and the city will belong to the prince. Each of these areas will be eight and one-third miles wide, extending in opposite directions to the eastern and western borders of Israel, with the sacred lands and the sanctuary of the temple in the center. So the priest land will include everything between the territories allotted to, to Judah and Benjamin, except for the area set aside for the sacred lands of the city. These are the territories allotted to the rest of the tribes. Benjamin's territory lies just south of the prince's lands, and it extends across the entire land of Israel from east to west. South of Benjamin's territory lies that of Simeon, also extending across the land from east to west. Next is the territory of Issachar, with the same eastern and western boundaries. Then comes the territory of Zebulun, which also extends across the land from east to west. 
The territory of Gad is just south of Zebulun with the same borders to the east and west. The southern border of Gad runs from Tamar to the waters of Meribah at Kadesh, and then follows the brook of Egypt to the Mediterranean. These are the allotments that will be set aside for each tribe's exclusive possession. I, the sovereign Lord, have spoken. And so, you know, like I said before, you can look that, um, so, you know, some renderings of that allotment up, you know, people's, uh, people's interpretation of that. Um, and it's interesting to see it. it it's like, it's like, uh, it's like levels, um, you know, just kind of running east to west, each tribe going from south to north and north to south. And, and, uh, you know, their northern and southern boundary for each tribe seems to be the same, um, you know, which is, which is interesting, which is, you know, and if you compare that with the original allotment that the people received when they went in, uh, the first time, uh, it's very, very different, you know, and so, uh, you know, don't quite understand the meaning of it myself, but it's interesting. So verse 30, these will be the exits to the city on the north wall, which is one and a half miles long. There will be three gates, each one named after a tribe of Israel. The first will be named for Reuben, the second for Judah, and the third for Levi. On the east wall, also one and a half miles long, the gates will be named for Joseph, Benjamin, and Dan. The south wall, also one and a half miles long, will have gates named for Simeon, Issachar, and Zebulun. And on the west wall, also one and a half miles long, the gates will be named for Gad, Asher, and Naphtali. The distance around the entire city will be six miles. And from that day, the name of the city will be the Lord is there. Interesting, you know, and um, so that that concludes the book. But, uh, you know, one one thought uh, that I did have about this reallocation of the land, you know, the the redistribution of how the the tribes are arranged, how the names, even the names on the gates are, are different from the way that the encampments were given around the tabernacle in, uh, you know, under Moses, because the, the order by which they uh, left the encampment and by which they set up the encampment was, uh, you know, a certain, followed a certain order, you know, a certain order of tribes. And it's the same here, but the order is different. And so, you know, just the only thought that I had, if this was something that God had intended for them to be able to do if their hearts had been right when they came back from that first exile, but they were unable to do, um, then even then it would stand, these instructions would stand as a witness against uh, their conduct. And they could look back and, and uh, you know, feel remorse, you know, feel like a, feel the godly kind of sorrow that leads one to repentance over these things. And so then you could look at it from the standpoint that this, I mean, maybe there's some spiritual um, significance behind the ordering or the reordering of these tribes, you know, uh, if you will. Um, maybe there's some spiritual significance there that I am not aware of currently. But then it also could just simply be that uh, the the last shall be first and the first last, you know, the the what we think it should be, uh, is, it doesn't have to be that way. What God, you know, really wants is for us to align our desires with his and to not, um, think of things of have and have it as a, in, in the way of like having to be a certain order, a certain way, you know, it's like, um, you know, you had the one family of priests that lost their place because of their unfaithfulness to God. And this other family of priests is elevated you know, and so it's not, um, you know, well, it always has to be, you know, this way. And because it's always been this way, I can act however I want, you know, like those priests might have, I mean, they, they, they expected to have that position forever. They expected that, uh, you know, and they, they, to the point of lying about it and deluding themselves like, well, yeah, we're never going to be carried off into, into exile. We'll just continue to do what we want to do. We're going to justify the leaders in, in, uh, in what they're doing and not teach people, uh, you know, the, the full ways of God, we're just going to, we're just going to hold on to this priesthood forever. And we're just going to maintain this status quo. And we're always going to have it this way, just because we're the ones who have been uh, allotted this, but God is clearly sh showing he can allot it in whatever, in whatever way he wants. He doesn't have to, just because he had it one way before, doesn't mean he has to keep it the same way. It's like the family of Eli, you know, uh, when God, uh, uh, the, the, t the, the tent of meeting, in the days of the judges was set at Shiloh. And, uh, 
because of Eli's conduct, God removed it from that place. And then they, you know, during David's time, God pointed out, this is, you know, the, this, uh, this certain mount, this is where the temple is going to be. That's where I'm going to move uh, this, this, you know, this is where you're going to build the temple and this is where I'm going to honor my name. And God uh, talked about that in, in Jeremiah. We read in, I think it was chapter seven, maybe, I think. Uh, but he talked about like, he, he's like, don't, don't you think, you know, by your, he was talking to the people and he's like, by your conduct, don't you think that I, I mean, look at, go to Shiloh and look what I did there and how I shamed that place and, and moved uh, my name from that place. And I and moved it here. He's like, don't, don't think that I won't do that again. In other words, it, it's the same, same thing that same principle that John the Baptist brought out when he was baptizing and the, the Pharisees were there. And he's like, who warned you to escape God's judgment? And he said, don't say to yourselves, we're safe because we're descendants of Abraham. God said, God, Abraham, uh, I mean, and then, excuse me, as soon as John said that, as soon as he said, don't think you're, you're safe because you're just because you're physical descendants of Abraham. He said, because God can raise up descendants of Abraham from these very stones, you know, so God can do whatever he wants. You know, it doesn't matter if you're, if you're a priest, doesn't matter if you're a pastor, doesn't matter if you're a bishop, doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. What matters is, is your heart right before the Lord? That's what matters because God can re, uh, reportion, he can reallot, he can reassign, he can do whatever he needs to do in order to ensure that people's hearts are loyal to him. And so I um, think that's a, a good stopping point here. So once again, congratulations for getting through the book of Ezekiel. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for all of those who uh, tune in here with me. I see them as a blessing, Father God. And uh, they are your people, the sheep of your pasture. I ask that you would bless them with abundance, Lord. I ask that you would bless them with uh, uh, what they need in due season, Lord God. Bless their, their, their going out. Bless their coming in. Bless their rising up. Bless their lying down. I thank you for all of them. And in Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Well, bless you guys. And we will see you again.